Hello everyone. A very good evening to all of you and welcome to this webinar. Firstly, thank you so much for taking the time out for this webinar in between your office work and work at home. We really appreciate it and we hope that you will take away practical insights from this webinar. We are all getting accustomed to the self isolation and the gaming industry though it continues to thrive in these times. The appetite keeps growing and we hope to take you through some of the practical aspects impacting the Indian gaming industry. I'm Rishabh Bharadwaj, a partner in the corporate and commercial group and gaming law practice of Khedan and Co. And I will be moderating this webinar today. Today we are, uh, we are fortunate to have here with us Roland Landers. Roland, as you know, is the CEO of AIGF, All India Gaming Federation. AIGF is the apex industry body for online real money scale gaming and has leading Indian and international stakeholders as its members. Roland is an accomplished leader and his expertise cover gaming, media, entertainment and sports businesses. Roland has built top ranked global media brands, statistical systems and successful intellectual properties in the past. We also have with us my colleagues Ganesh Prasad, Surbi Kejriwal and Manindra Mishra. Ganesh is a partner in the corporate and commercial group in our Bengaluru office. He has close to two decades of experience and he focuses on technology, e-commerce and the gaming sector. He's also on the advisory board of AIGF and the Federation of Indian Fantasy Sports. He's a ranked lawyer by Chambers and Partners and ILFR. Surti is a partner in the corporate and commercial group in our Mumbai office. With over 14 years of experience, her expertise lies in private equity, venture capital, mergers and acquisitions, and regulatory and strategic advisory, and her focus lies in the gaming sector. She sits on the boards of various listed companies and has also been voted as a rising star in Asia law leading lawyers. Manmendra is a member of our dispute resolution practice group in our Mumbai office. He focuses on white collar crimes, strategic advisory, and international and domestic arbitrations. He's closely associated with the Mumbai Center of International Arbitration, the Society of Construction Laws Young Leaders Group, and the Indian Arbitration Forum. He's an avid sportsman, and he has been active on the sports and gaming sector. He regularly advises clients and represents them before various authorities and courts, including Enforcement Directorate, the CBI, and the police. Today, we have a very interesting mix of audience before us. We have uh, companies, uh, promoters, investors, and various other stakeholders. Our webinar will broadly cover self-regulation, responsible gaming, best practices, and downgrades in police actions. But before we proceed, there are a few housekeeping items that we should be mindful of. We intend to have an open forum where the speakers will discuss all the topics as a panel discussion with questions being laid before the forum. Our audience also have the ability to ask live questions during the webinar. So please type them. Please type them on your webinar portal. You'll see it on the right hand side. We will take them. We will take these questions at the end of the webinar and we have budgeted around 15, 20 minutes for this towards the end. If we do not get time to get back to you on any of your questions today. We will try to get back to you over email after the webinar. Lastly, since all of us are working from home and are joining this webinar remotely, there is a possibility of technical issues and service interruptions. If at any time we lose a speaker due to technical issues, we will move to the next speaker and we will get back to the speaker once they have gotten back. We'll now start our discussion. As all of us are aware, while all of us are aware, I'll give a short background of the legal background of gaming in India. The constitution of India confers powers on the states, the states and not the union or the federal government to make laws regarding betting and gambling. And the jurisprudence around gambling and gaming, including the skill based games in India is emanating from the Public Gambling Act of 1867. The constitution was adopted. Various states adopted Public Gambling Act some with changes, some without changes, and some of the states have come up with their own laws. 
this legal scheme has resulted in a scattered regulatory regime around gaming in india which is a which is causing a lot of confusions and conflict across the sector with this backdrop i will now pose my first question to roland roland a very warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us we all know that aigf has played a key role in the growth of uh, growth of the gaming industry can you please share with us an overview of the real money gaming industry in india and what role aigf has played thank you rishab for the introduction and uh, for having me uh, on this webinar uh, good evening everyone who have joined in the webinar uh, the aigf started uh, four years back in may of 2016 with the objective to bring industry recognition to the online real money skill gaming space since 2018 we've seen a lot of interest from various stakeholder groups including gamers game development companies startups and investors and uh, aided with the with the background that you know the country alongside was going through a digital transformation and that helped grow the sector today to a uh little over rupees to 4000 crore uh, industry as of now it is uh, growing at a robust pace uh, at cagr cagr levels what we have seen also uh, globally online gaming has emerged as one of the favorite pastimes both in terms of size and average arpus which is much bigger than music and movies and even tv collectively many experts and economists believe like we do at the agf that india too is moving in that direction having today the maximum number of game downloads and close to 300 game developers in the last 4 years the agf has evolved and uh, what we have done is we have categorized the online skill gaming businesses into broadly four categories uh, these comprise online uh, poker online rummy which collectively make up the card games we have the daily fantasy sports and the digital skill games or esports our members range from top operators in each of these business segments along with other stakeholders and we continue to work with our advisory panels uh, and partners including ganesh prasad from petan and petan so over the last 4 years there have been a lot of uh, initiatives that we have undertaken i would like to highlight some of them so the one of the most important uh, initiatives obviously is the implementation of the self regulation charters for the aigf stakeholders because these are based on the uh, self regulation model and uh, and the fundamentals of pillars of legality integrity user rights and best practices apart from the above the main focus of the charters are around responsible gaming and protection for players and alongside that some advertising guidelines for the business operators uh, we have a a diverse and expert uh, committee at the agf that oversees uh, that has not only vetted these charters but also oversees uh, the uh, implementation of the charters by the members as well as approvals on product innovations that some of the members may bring about some of the names that make up this committee are justice vikram ajit sen dr yamini agarwal professor deepak dayanidhi from iim kozhikode professor anindya ghosh from the new york stern university and many more the next steps of the charter implementations obviously are the are the uh, audits at the agf it would be conducted it is being conducted by one of the big four audit firms and uh, you are happy to mention here that you know this has already got an underway underway we have made several industry representations to uh, you know state and central ministries uh, the tax authorities also that has led to some uniform methodologies for both direct and indirect taxation amongst the members uh, i would like to highlight the uh, the work that we are doing with meti to impress upon them the need 
for endorsing our charters uh, and you know for that we've done uh, uh, representations with their key stakeholders along with ours to to explain the entire gaming process and how it is uh, happens including the payment processes we also work with some of the uh, consulting firms while they put together the reports on the online skill gaming industries including uh, EY, KPMG, Media Partners Asia. Uh, these reports are put together for mainly media and entertainment uh, uh, industry, including the FIKI frames and other such reports. We've also done a report uh, with our partner, with our member, Mobile Premier League, which was launched by Rajya Sabha MP Mary Kom, which focused on the mental and health benefits of the digital esports uh, segment. And uh, we've also, you know, in our educational uh, work, we've tried to bring to the fore the importance of, you know, the skills involved in various online skill games like poker in particular, with various judicial academy, academies, including the Delhi Judicial Academy. And uh, also, we have had one-on-one -on -one interactions with leading editors of key media publishing houses. Lastly, we've had the opportunity to work uh, a producer report uh, which formed the basis for the law commission of india uh, recommendations uh, for not only regulating sports betting in the country but also creating a central gaming commission for the online real money gaming businesses uh, so i think uh, rishabh that would uh, cover some of the things that i wanted to highlight thank you thank you Rohan. very helpful and these interactions and efforts certainly will help spread the awareness and set the industry its standards. We'll now move on to our next question, and that's to you, Ganesh. Ganesh, usually one often hears stakeholders in the gaming industry attributing ambiguity and uncertainty over gaming regulations in India. What are the reasons for these ambiguities on gaming on games of chance versus games of skill? And where, in your view, uh, does this uncertainty come from? Yeah, thank you, Nishab, um, and a very warm welcome to all the people who are listening here. Uh, firstly, as you mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, gaming is a state subject under the Constitution of India. Most states have adopted that the Public Gambling Act of 1867. Now, very few states have specifically prescribed certain games as being games of skill by either notifications or statutes. For example, you would see in states of West Bengal, Nagaland, Sikkim, etc., uh, a lot of games have been actually uh, codified uh, and mentioned as games of skills. Now, given that there is no central law which determines which games are games of skill or games of chance, there's a fair bit of ambiguity. The second ambiguity arises owing to interpretation of case laws. Now, this is a little technical. Every case determined by a competent court has to be a reasoned order based on the facts surrounding it. Typically, an order of a court has two parts to it. One, the reasoning behind an order based on the facts specific to each case, which we call as the arbiter. And two, the decision or conclusion based on the facts considered or reasoned by the court, which is the dicta. Now, if you look at almost all cases around gaming laws in India, including the Satinarayana judgment, which is touted to be the foremost decision recognizing Rami as a game of skill, Courts have in their decision stuck to the premise that if there is a preponderance of skill in any game, they would be deemed to be a game of skill. They have not gone extensively into the facts surrounding the case as courts fail to understand the nuances of rummy or poker or for that matter any card games. Now the reason surrounding this ambiguity is because of the manner in which certain games that are traditionally deemed to be games of skills have been played by players or have been offered by operators or gaming houses, uh, you know, using a different yardstick or, or some further nuances there. In almost all of the cases that have come up before the court, you know that the, prosec the prosecution would have failed to establish or educate the courts as to why a particular game of skill was rendered to be a game of chance. Now, courts then are forced mm -hmm. to leave fairly open-ended, and this leads to different interpretations. 
Now, even though Article 142 of the Constitution of India renders all judgments of the Supreme Court of India as law enforceable in India, you will see that Rami was held to be illegal initially by the High Court of Kerala. Now, upon appeal before the divisional bench, the Kerala High Court reverted to the position that Rami would not be gambling if played as a game of skill without getting into the facts surrounding side betting or for that matter the circumstances that led to the case coming before the court in the first instance. It was a drunken brawl, to be very honest, by players alleging collision between the gaming house and the players. Now, third and most importantly, forget all the legalities, I think to the to the listeners here on this webinar who are non-lawyers, I would like to share an experience which we have gained through our interaction with the government. Today, while we lawyers keep harping about case laws and issues that have cropped up in situations, you need to understand that all case laws, other than possibly in fantasy games, are primarily surrounding physical clubs or gaming houses and are not usually specific to online gaming. In fact, in my personal experience and basis discussions which I have had with the Law Commission of India, some GST council members and mighty also, most online operators, they believe, should ideally be considered as a marketplace or intermediaries providing a platform for users to play games. This is effectively like an Amazon or a Flipkart model where the liability of the platforms are limited to issues surrounding integrity or lack of fair play or misuse of user information rather than holding them on an equal footing with physical clubs and gaming houses. So to sum it up, Rishabh, the interplay of all these factors and the lack of a central regulator for online gaming is, to my mind, the result of uh, the ambiguity in this particular space. Thanks, Ganesh, and that's quite insightful. So the key takeaway would be that law and the law enforcement has not been able to catch up with the subsequent trends in technology. That's right. Taking this discussion forward, uh, my next question is to Surbi. Surbi, in view of these ambiguities that Ganesh just explained, what, in your view, are the risks that these gaming companies are facing today? Right. Um, thank you, Rishabh. Uh, and a very good evening to all my fellow panelists and to all of you who've taken the time to listen in to us today. Uh, Rishabh, you've raised a critical question, and I think it's an important piece in this whole gaming law puzzle. The way I see it, we can bucket the risks into uh, a few categories. Let me take them one by one. I think the first and the foremost category of risk is the obvious one. It's, it's what we can broadly classify as regulatory risk. You all must be aware of the differing views that the high courts of various states have taken. Now, the lack and consistency of the views taken by these high courts serves as a genesis for the regulatory uncertainty. Let me give you a few examples. In 2019, uh, the Kerala High Court ruled that Rami played for money is a game of chance and thus amounted to gambling under the local gambling laws. Now, this was completely opposite the position established by the Supreme Court and the other high courts like Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Madras, which had consistently in the past ruled that Rami, even if it's played for stakes, will be deemed to be a game of skill. Let me give you another example. The Gujarat High Court in 2018, much to the dismay of most poker players in this country, ruled poker to be a game of chance. Now, I know all of you all who play poker seriously are, are sort of scoffing at this, but well, this is what it is right now. The appeal is of course pending before the division bench of the Gujarat High Court, so the matter is subjudice. But again, this was contrary to the positions taken by the Calcutta and the Karnataka High Courts. So these are just a few examples of the regulatory risk that, it, uh, that, that the law today poses. I think it's also important uh, to, to note one, one thing about the gaming laws in India. Look, the law does not lay down any bright line test or objectively definable test to determine whether a game will be considered to be a game of chance or a game of skill. Now, in India, the characterization process has been rather reactive than proactive, and this sort of adds on to the entire risk package of gaming companies. Let me give you a few more examples of what sort of regulatory risks have been posed. Now, 
legislation on gaming laws like ganesh mentioned earlier is within the domain of the states the central government doesn't um, rule on those and different states have dealt with it in their own unique way so for instance states like nagaland and sikkim have moved to a licensing regime they very clearly recognize these games even online versions as games of skill but they say hey look you need a license to operate then you of course have states like telangana which have come down extremely heavily on certain kinds of online gaming which has led to certain businesses to restructure the way they function so rishab this is sort of the kind of regulatory risks that i that i foresee the second bucket of risk is what i really like to call as investor risks now this is twofold one is of course um you know it encompasses gaming companies making their portals and businesses what we call investor ready so that they can receive uh, investment in their companies and the second aspect of this is the risks that the investors in these companies need to safeguard against themselves either when they are investing or when they are sort of governing their gaming portfolio companies let's directly deal with india's exchange control regulations as this directly impacts overseas investors in the gaming industry now we all know that fdi is prohibited in activities like gambling and betting and like i mentioned before the risk of a game being construed as a game of chance will persist because there's no bright line test and if that is the case then these gaming companies consequently become in ineligible to receive foreign investment um moreover any sort of post investment change in law whether it is by way of an adverse judgment or a legislative uh, enactment or an ordinance coupled with the risk of a let's say an overnight raid leading to a closure or suspension of business leads to significant erosion in shareholder value which has been experienced unfortunately by a few gaming companies so so rishab in my view these are the two two major risks that i foresee or that i have seen gaming companies deal with thanks so before highlighting these so these are the key risks and uh, you know which are regulatory or policy risks uh, also investor risk in a way these are external risks what do you think right. what are your thoughts about risks that are more organizational or operational in nature right so of course these are external risks and you are right that uh, along with these external risks there are a whole host of operational risks that over the years have sort of pose being posed to the gaming companies we we've, we've been fortunate enough as a firm to have advised on some of those and let me try and um, sort of narrow this down for the uh, benefit of our audience look primarily the most common operational risk that we always hear uh, with regard to gaming companies is that look their software is rigged or there are computer bots that are playing now rigging allegations are extremely frequent for industry players and it's mostly done by you know users who unfortunately lost a lot of money and they use it as a uh, as an excuse to recover some of that uh, money so they always allege manipulated systems against the providers um another uh, uh, operational risk that we've seen companies deal with is uh, you know consumer complaints now a lot of disgruntled consumers who've lost substantial amounts of money uh, will will lodge a police complaint saying that a fraud has been inflicted on them or uh, or that uh, the systems are not fair or that they didn't know that they were uh, uh, you know using these uh, uh, or they they didn't know that they were going to lose so much money so look in the end the gaming companies may um, uh, end up successful in defending themselves against these consumer complaints because frankly a lot of these are frivolous but it does do a lot of damage to these companies there's a lot of bad publicity that comes with it and it creates a real big nuisance value for the companies because they then have to concentrate on dealing with these consumer complaints as opposed to running running the business rishab i'll take another minute and i'll talk about a, a, a rather nuanced risk that these gaming companies face uh, and you know this is directly dealt with in the in the aigf uh, charter and maybe roland can touch upon this uh, sometime uh, uh now later but uh look gaming providers deal with two kinds of funds the first kind of fund is is their own working capital fund and the second kind of fund is the funds that the players have given them so like the aigf charter uh you know they are supposed to demarcate these uh two kinds of funds so they can't use the player funds for their day to day needs 
now uh, for established gaming companies this is this is part and parcel of daily life it's it's protocol it's been ingrained in their systems and they follow it to the t by putting the player money in a separate escrow or in a separate uh, account with a separate sop altogether but for the newer players who are just sort of coming to the fold this can pose a little bit of a uh, uh, you know operational challenge uh, so you know based on my assessment these are the sort of operational risks uh, you know and of course there are two more two or three more risks which are uh, pretty uh, common one is of course the tax risk on you know how the gst authorities will classify this uh, game as will it be a game of chance or a game of skill because the incidence of taxation on game of chance is significantly higher than on the game of skill and the second and the most important one is on of of enforcement agency the risk of enforcement agencies and police actions whether it's on the grounds of money laundering or chip dumping or offering games of chance in the garb of game of skill so that's another issue that that creates a lot of problem and look rishab if i were to summarize this whole thing i feel that the biggest challenge remains one of perception of card games in india in particular being seen as games of chance now stakeholders across along with guidance from industry bodies like the aigf here we'll have to work over time to change this perception for good thanks for being that's quite insightful for the benefit of our audience actually we'll we'll be discussing uh, the enforcement uh, risk related points uh, in a short while uh, we also have uh, some of the audience questions on some of the topics that you've touched upon so we'll we'll take them up towards the end uh, now uh, back to you ganesh and uh, you know given the risk that surbhi just uh, highlighted what do you think the gaming companies uh, they can do or they should be doing to safeguard themselves against these risks see i think uh, rishab each of the ambiguities or risk factors will have to be dealt with based on specific situations there is really no one size fits all so let me start with that however in general i would advise companies to have a very proactive player protection program as their priority now you have geo blocking circuit breakers uh, for addiction prevention mechanisms safeguards against overspending regular software audits etc which will all go a long way in ensuring that companies are being free from risk and this can be achieved more by educating users educating uh, regulators and ensuring responsible gaming overall stringent kyc processes which are linked to pan numbers or other ids before onboarding users and investors definitely help but today the way the industry is uh, positioned kyc is done while withdrawing money or at the end of the game given tax considerations operators do not want to scare people away while onboarding them and that's one of the issues which possibly people sort of uh, Uh, are dealing with um and also from a international best practice uh, i would say financial integrity encryption standards system integrity detection of manipulation or gaming algorithms or uh, to prevent misuse by gamblers etc would definitely help and most responsible companies have these uh, measures which are inbuilt into their uh, platforms extensive policies on treatment of user money promotional expenses of chips affiliate relationships etc and uh, you know make making sure that enforcement related uh, actions are reduced to a large extent um, we have also seen that uh, you know developing education material on the portals providing users with uh, adequate training in terms of uh, uh, responsible gaming uh, helps uh, you know keep or uh, you know uh, accusations of uh, uh, you know the the port the gaming uh, operators sort of you know swindling them and all of that uh, at bay so all in all good governance is what makes operators attractive both for users and also from an investor perspective if investors were to sort of look at uh, operators and companies in terms of uh, their processes and how they are actually looking at responsible gaming thank you ganesh and the key takeaway that i understand is that the compliance and efficiency processes will go a long way in creating value and having a sustainable uh, model for these companies that's right now 
Next, yeah. moving on to my next question, which is to Roland. Roland, if you could throw some light on whether the companies have implemented these uh, bells and whistles, or if you see in your experience, uh, you know, what are the practical difficulties and challenges these gaming companies uh, see in implementing or face in implementing these measures? Because I'm sure all of them are aware of these measures. How does it work out practically? Yeah, thanks, Rishabh. Uh, so obviously, one of the difficulties in implement implementing uh, uh, these processes are, you know, the different state laws or acts and the interpretations, which uh, you know the team at Kaitan on the panel is best equipped to answer, and some of them have already answered them. But uh, from my, from our perspective, we have to keep in mind uh, that the industry is uh, very nascent, only about eight to ten years old and uh, has been getting the much needed recognition only over the last probably three years so in the absence of regulation operators ran their businesses amid ambiguity with the sole objective of growth and you know achieving scale however when the agf was formed and you know went about implement uh, putting together the charters and the methodology behind it getting it vetted by the experts we are happy to mention that all of our members were very receptive to start adopting the self regulation policies of the aga and these are you know primarily centered as i mentioned earlier around responsible gaming and the protection of players so what we have done is the process we follow is obviously once a member signs up to the aga we give them between 3 to 6 months to bring their business processes into sync uh, with the guidelines of the charters and uh, once that is done and it is operational they would go through the audit process as i mentioned earlier and uh, finally be in line for getting the agf seal now this was obviously a good first step for all our members you know to come together under the AGs of the AIGF and adopt uniform guidelines for good governance. And we believe that uh, these would really hold us in good stead and mitigate some of the points that Ganesh just mentioned. And prior to that, Surbi as risk, because uh, you know, as we in our quest, as we go and meet with the uh, uh, relevant uh, ministries who we believe going forward could be the eventual regulators. It will help us in overcoming the wrong notions associated with the with the industry. There are other parallel industry, other sectors which uh, follow similar processes. Uh, I would like to mention about ASCII here, uh, the Advertising Standards Council of India, which got the recognition for the quote from the Supreme Court. Similarly, the Indi uh, Indian Broadcasting Federation uh, has got endorsement. To their self-regulation charters from the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. So we are also hopeful that you know the AGF charters uh, going forward would get similar endorsement from probably the the METI or uh, similar such uh, ministry. Member uh, audits uh, once completed will make the process smoother and better for us to liaise with these uh, with these ministries that we have in mind. And uh, we would like to really take this up in earnest uh, going forward. But uh, yeah, so these are some of the things that one needs to keep in mind when we talk about the uh, you know the uh, the problems in uh, getting this implemented. So we give them a time, and I'm happy to mention that most of our members have now uh, pretty much adopted those starters and are brought their processes in sync with them. Thank you, Rishabh. Thank you, Roland. Now, should we briefly discuss about the enforcement risk when she was talking about various kinds of risk? Uh, taking, uh, moving forward from there, and it, the question is to Manvendra now. Uh, Manvendra, could you elaborate upon these enforcement risks? We've all seen recently the police reports and inquiries against companies. So it will be great if you can let our audience know as to what are the kinds of enforcement agencies that are the gatekeepers of this industry. And under what legislations and regulations are these agencies operating? 
Sure. Thanks, Rishabh. Um, like we have heard before from Ganesh that this is a state subject. There are around 21 different legislations across the states which pertain to gaming and gambling laws which are prevalent in India. So uh, instead of going into a deep dive onto the, uh, the legislations, what I'll do is maybe touch upon the practical aspects and what we have seen in the past. So now there are two aspects to this. One is the physical club premises and office where police raids or dawn raids have been conducted in the past. And the other is the online gaming companies and the issues that they have faced in this scenario. I'll take the online gaming issues first. Now, uh, like we all know, it's a nascent industry. So historically, at least in India, we have seen limited police action against online companies. There was a furor created in 2017 in Telangana when there were certain suicides which happened and the players had in the last communication with gaming companies or had written to uh, a customer care in the last uh, communication. In those cases, the police did summon the CEOs of the company or senior management and uh, Cyberabad police station did look into this from an uh, angle. Now, mind you, the, there was no liability on the gaming company per se in this scenario. However, because abetment to suicide is an offense in India, there was a little bit of arm twisting. But that is the, the worst action that people have seen in India. What happens on a more routine process is disgruntled customers may use local police if they have cloud to register complaints and they will allege that although it's a skill activity, that this is a gambling or they've been defrauded, they've been lured in to put their money or those kind of things where you will get phone calls from the police station or you get summons from the police station. It's important to see how best and how fast you can close this. This is the local police. It will be under the criminal procedure code and the Indian penal code. From an operator's perspective, I think more on the way the industry is growing, there's something that we really need to look at because this is something that has happened in the international countries in the past. Employee frauds, chip dumpings, collusive activities where internal, some controller or some stakeholder of the company is involved. Because in these cases, not just is there a police action and there will be summons under Section 91 of Criminal Procedure Code, you have to remember that these companies are Indian, are registered under the Indian laws. And under the Companies Act 2013 amendment, there is a fraud reporting mechanism wherein you have to report to the auditor, you have to take action at a board level. So to ring fence the board and other things has becomes very important. So that is something that is coming up. It's a new thing, but we have heard of instances which is uh, happening there. Another issue which we have seen live is that of data theft. Uh, one of someone we were advising in Delhi had their IT main IT guy run off with the passwords and could not be traced. So that was an issue. And uh, you have to report to police immediately, get a civil suit filed, get an injunction order against the person from really breaching or leaking the data or using it for personal benefit. That's a live issue. Data Privacy Act actually has been amended and there's a new bill in place which uh, creates a little bit more regulations than what exist currently. So that is something which needs to be looked at. Um, uh, the not so frequent, but I'm sure people here who do fan, who have seen fantasy games might have got notices from a BCCI or a FIFA or from any international sports authority if they're using any of their logos or team names in adverted manner. If you do not take necessary action and pull those down, there can be a raid in your premises. We know of one such situation in India. Now, other than all of this, from a monetary perspective, I mean, Foreign Exchange Management Act is a big uh, elephant in the room. The Enforcement Directorate actually investigates any such complaints therein. Now, let's, let's be clear of one thing. The Prevention of Money Laundering Act does not automatically get dragged in because gambling is not an offense covered under it. But if the company has been used as a conduit, and if there is money which is coming to the company which is deemed to be proceeds of crime, then Prevention of Money Laundering Act can be involved. And from that perspective, Enforcement Directorate becomes the regulator and they are a very strict, no nonsense guys to be handling. Um, in addition to all of this, I think we have seen very limited consumer cases where operators have not settled directly with the players. 
but again far and few now interestingly the delhi high court is actually seized up a matter at the moment where a chartered accountant has filed a case against the ministry of information and technology finance ministry and rbi and the issues is the rbi permission for remittance of money outside india so it's quite tricky and it will be interesting to see how that pans out but this is more or less what you see from a regulatory perspective for online gaming physical gaming aspect don raids seizure of products seizure of chips seizure of uh, documents lying this is the most important thing which has happened and again unregulated allegations we haven't seen conviction but that's something that is happening around thank you risha thanks manvendra that's an important piece of information to keep in mind uh, and and you know this leads to the next logical question you mentioned about don raids and all uh what should the companies do when there are inquiries from governmental agencies what should the promoters or the management be mindful of in these uh, you know situations and what are the rights that are available to uh, uh, the companies or their uh, management and founders right okay uh, again like we have we've been hearing about the bangalore raids and we heard it from a couple of other parts of the country at the moment so again raid is actually a colloquial term which is used the term in indian law is search and seizure under section 55 of the criminal procedure of code so while it may seem like it's basically other uh, officers walk in they start doing whatever they want to they ask you for summons please note that this is the regulated legal power and a, it has to be exercised in a particular manner so first and foremost a, a search needs a search warrant so what i'll do is instead of getting into the technicalities of how the warrant and everything is there let's i'll just going to touch upon what you can do if you are on the receiving side of a search first and foremost please check the search warrant if the premises named in the warrant are exactly the same premises where the search is being carried out second the power to seize documents or any other objects is contained in the warrant or not usually the names and designations of the officers who are authorized to conduct the raid is mentioned in such warrant that is something that one can check if you are actually in a situation where a raid has is being conducted uh, there are some uh, precautions that you sorry, sorry there are some some documents that you can claim privilege on which is basically trade secrets confidential communication between client attorney and any document which you deem is self incriminating and you can refuse the presence thereof pick up the phone on an independent witness like your lawyer or a ca or any person in the vicinity an independent person being present is a, is a big uh, plus point when it comes to the trial process last but not the least please make sure that the seizure memo contains details of everything that the police has picked up and there is nothing which has been picked up without it being documented now from a precautionary perspective and to ring fence yourself there are three important things one please do not tamper with anything at the moment that's that's vitally important because when the police officers are coming in you won't really be in a place where you will ask them hey sorry show me this document etc so please do cooperate with them but make sure that you have certain documents in your premises which can assist you in preventing or this entire exercise becoming extensively coercive keep opinions from your lawyers which are required to show that there's a game of skill which is being played and not a game of chance take detailed disclosures from your customers as they walk in we have seen some of the clubs around the country start a online form wherein you click on an i agree button and there are certain conditions that they will not play or gamble or be do any illegal activity per se that is a good way of ring fencing yourself and while uh, you are cooperating with the cops please do try and see if you can show them certain judgments of the particular state that you are in where the poker or the game that you are playing has been held to be a game of skill in our experience more often than not the opinion has gone a long way out and this is something that has been relied upon but uh, beyond that you just need to make sure that it is conducted in a manner where it is not overtly coercive to the people or the belongings 
However, important points, once the raid is concluded, please immediately do a debrief, prepare a briefing note of the questions asked, the documents taken, what else do we do, what transpired during the time. Whenever you are discussing with your lawyers immediately thereafter or with the police directly, please do make sure that you dictate the terms which actually transpired therein rather than the version which has been given out. However, that said, you know, we have seen certain instances where people have tried to uh, market themselves as casinos or there are WhatsApp messages being sent out which actually do not follow the line. And in these cases, there might actually be an issue on the people in whose premises these activities were being conducted. But that said, be civil, get your lawyer, and you should be sorted because as on date, there have been no convictions, like I mentioned. Thanks, Rishabh. Thanks, Manvendra. Uh, so we've discussed risks around almost all the stakeholders. And my next question to you again is about the most important stakeholders in the ecosystem, the users, the players. What, in your uh, view, are the risks upon uh, these the players or the users of the platforms? Can any action be taken against them? Okay, yeah, clearly, uh, definitely the most important stakeholder. First and foremost, if you are sticking to online gaming, there is no liability on the players per se, unless they are indulging in any illegal activity or a side betting or false declarations, which renders them to be in breach of the extent laws. Now, see, as an industry, we do hear of complaints of stacking, black accounts, collusion with other players, etc. But these are situations which can be dealt with at operator levels. The operators have been diligent and have taken action about the same. And while there is no hiding from the fact that you know that stables do exist and there are other activities which are deemed by players to be illegal, they need not actually be illegal. Now, as long as the acts are being within the rules, regulations, and the terms and conditions of the platform that they are using. That said, uh, most operators have checks and balances in place today uh, to prevent themselves from becoming a conduit for money laundering or being participant to any act where the players can sort of try and bring in uh, any liability. Fraud detection is a tool which is being used by operators now and uh, right from net winnings to collusion to whether what is the relationship factor between the person and the other players in the room, whether they're referees, whether they're second referees, these things are already there in the sector. So as long as the, I don't see any challenge to the players being on the platform, unless they themselves are indulged in an activity which is beyond the scope of what is being provided on the platform, and that leads it to some sort of a liability. Uh, but again, no, nothing is 100% secure in this world. And uh, we do know of situation where this gentleman used his entire village to get bonus chips and indulge in chip dumping. So I would say that, no, I don't see there's a liability for players if they stick to it. But that said, uh, don't try to be over smart or try to bend the system because that may just lend you in the soup. Thanks, Rishabh. That should be it. Thank you, Manvendra. And that's quite helpful to know, I mean, for especially for the user and the player community. Uh, you know, it's it's almost time, so I would like to now throw the one final question before the panel, which is on the way forward. Now, given the above challenges that we have uh, discussed, which are affecting the industry, what do you think, you know, are these, how, what's the next, what's the way forward, the best way forward? Like, you know, how can it be dealt with in a more structured manner? Should there be an industrial industry regulator or should we make self-regulation more robust and encourage it further? On that, Roland, uh, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rishabh. Uh, there are differing views on this uh, subject and we ourselves have been trying various approaches. One view obviously is to have a central gaming commission as proposed by the Law Commission of India also. But we also need to be mindful of the fact that there exists inadequate knowledge about the industry because it is so nascent, uh, about best practices, and also a lack of regulators, actually. Uh, 
uh, one possible solution, if that is the way forward, could be that you know the AIGF, since we've already done some much work in the self-regulation uh, uh, side, can play associate role with the commission if it's a possibility. And uh, you know these starters that we've already put in place can probably form the basis for for formal regulation going forward. Um, for the timing, however, our collective view is that that the industry continues to be self-regulated, uh, but uh, in the footsteps of probably what the IBF is doing, have endorsement to the self-regulation charters by a uh, relevant ministry like the METI, so that the implementation at our end can be extremely robust. I am uh, delighted to mention that most of the risks that uh, should be mentioned and the other points and issues that uh, Ganesh and Manvendra brought up are uh, can be taken care of by the implementation of uh, the AGF charters by the operators. I would like to uh, briefly highlight some of them uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so, as I mentioned at the outset, the four pillars uh, starting with legality. So, here really we are focused on skill predominance only those games that have skill, paid games for adults only, transparent rules and fees offered only in permitting states, since this is a state subject, and predetermined and declared price. Uh, the second uh, pillar being integrity, so account separation between user fees, operational expenses, anti fraud and anti money laundering measures, user verification and TDS deductions. The third, uh, user rights. So technical safeguards to prevent unfair advantage, transparent declaration of results, refund in the case of cancellations, and respect user and user data privacy that Manvendra spoke about. And finally, the good practices. Service does not violate third party IP rights. The logo display subject to license, name and image use subject to consent, and finally, responsible gaming practices. So if uh, if uh, you know all the AIGF members do follow this, but you know if the industry can you know really uh, come together and start implementing this, then I think uh, uh, most of these uh, responsible gaming uh, practices can be ensured. Thank you, Rishabh. Thank you, Roland. Uh, Ganesh, would you like to share any thoughts on this on the way forward that you think? You know, I think uh, Roland, uh, I think summed it up uh, very succinctly. Uh, I personally believe that, you know, if you were to really look at, I would add one point, even Justice Shah's com Shah Committee report on sports betting uh, uh, should possibly be uh, considered in this particular conversation because India's, uh, you know, sports betting industry and uh, the current industry, what we are talking about, all of this, we are looking at a file accrual industry. And uh, yeah, technically, which is the illegal uh, amount of money which is actually you know passing hands at various corners. That's that's, it, that's these are the reports which are actually reported. And uh, now this segment, to my mind, uh, if it is regulated, and to my mind, if it is uh, to a large extent, uh, if there is even a self-regulatory body like EIGF which can possibly uh, take the lead which they have already done to a very large extent and very commendably too. Uh, and if there is uh, some form of a central uh, regulator like Roland said, uh, commission, uh, it would definitely help uh, the industry at large and also sort of ensure that responsible gaming uh, is achieved in the country. Thank you, thank you both. So in summary, the regulator, the sector regulator is the best case, but to reach there, we need to make our self-regulatory framework more robust and spread more awareness and protect our stakeholders. So organizations like AIGF are playing a key role in that, and we are happy to do our small bits uh, in, in those areas. So with that, I'd like to thank all our speakers. We will now take up the various questions which the participants have uh, sent in. Uh, some of these questions were uh, received by us during the registration process. Some of these questions have come in during the webinar. 
mm -hmm. we've received a fair bit of questions. Uh, in some cases, we'll club the questions together. And as I had mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, if we are not able to get to any of your questions today, we will certainly get back to you over email after the webinar. The first question is, how do the different variations of games look when we look at them from the perspective, the prism of various case laws uh, that are there on specific games? Is there any leeway for industry participants on innovating on games models? Or do they have to stick to what the ports have blessed? I think, Surbi, you discussed or you touched upon this uh, aspect uh, briefly. Would you like to take that? Right. Up? Right. Sure. Sure, Risha. So, yes, of course, you know, uh, we feel that there is enough headroom given in the gaming laws right now uh, to, to encourage a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, tweaks on the traditional model. Uh, a primary reason for that is, like we mentioned before, there is no hard coated test or there is no bright line test. The only test is that the game that is offered should be a game of skill and that the aspect of skill should be predominant over chance. So if these two yardsticks are met, there is no reason why different variations of the games uh, will not be acceptable. Look, if you look at the case laws, Rishabh, that have sort of evolved over the years, uh, they are on specific facts, right? Uh, either on traditional forms of poker or rummy or uh, uh, various other models. So the case laws are obviously subject to those facts, but that does not preclude our entrepreneurs from, from coming up with uh, innovative programs. For example, e-sport, you know, moving away from the traditional one sport aspect of cricket in our country. Uh, we, are, we are seeing a lot of interest, a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, uh, traction in the e-sport sector. So if in e-sports, in the model that you have that you play on your machines, if it can be demonstrated that you're using predominantly skill, even though some amount of chance can be there, there is no reason why it cannot be accommodated in the current legal framework. Thank you, Subhi. And now, now that we have you there, uh, you know, you discussed uh, escrow and, and, and funds, uh, fund management process. So a question mm -hmm. that has come to us uh, on, on that topic is on the diversification of funds and uh, one of our audience wants to know why is it required and why can't it be used for any other purpose like working capital? Right. See, the reason why it's required more than being mandated by any kind of law is, is you know, uh, as a player when I'm, and like Roland uh, mentioned in his uh, in his piece, that as a player I need to, I need to be uh, comfortable that there's fair play and I also need to be comfortable that I can redeem the chips or the money that I have put in seamlessly. So most importantly, it ensures seamless redemption so that there is no liquidity crunch or liquidity issue on the part of the gaming companies. Secondly, um, it's, it's part of international best practices. And third and most importantly, this forms an important component on the self-regulation aspect that, that my fellow speakers have highlighted. So it is these things that, uh, you know, instill confidence in the users that the industry is responsible, which is why it's extremely important that we have this demarcation. Understood. Thank you. Uh, the next question that has come in, and uh, I think earlier Ganesh was discussing about, uh, you know, the processes that help uh, creating shareholders value and, you know, sustainable models. Now, Ganesh, to your uh, mind, how do you think investors are looking at the industry currently? Uh, is there going to be deal traction in the short to midterm, in, in your opinion? Yeah, uh, Rishabh, that's a very pertinent question. And I think I should definitely tell you that as we speak, despite the COVID situation across the globe, we're looking at a little over a dozen transactional deals and advisories which the firm is doing. Uh, in this particular sector. And I think that, that's, I think, proof enough for us to sort of look at uh, where this sector is heading. Uh, I see uh, a lot of prospects, especially if companies are into responsible gaming and if they are able to offer a platform to investors uh, with, uh, with good governance practices, with, uh, uh, you know, following the letter of the law, in the spirit of the law, uh, and also possibly ensuring uh, fairness and transparency. There is so much of shareholder uh, uh, value 
which can be unlocked either through investors, financial investors, they could be at all levels, at multiple levels. And I think to answer your question, it's it's a growing industry and it will keep growing. Roland, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I uh, concur with what uh, Ganesh just mentioned. Uh, from our uh, vantage position at the AGF, we've been uh, approached by several uh, domestic as well as international investors, uh, obviously, you know, seeking uh, investments into the sector and particularly the uh, online uh, card games like poker. And would like to mention also the emerging uh, esports, digital esports segment, which is uh, which is a huge uh, area of interest for for inter for investors uh, looking inwards to India in the gaming sector. Yeah, and to also add, Rishabh, uh, one of the things which we see, there are sophisticated uh, US investors who are looking at this particular segment. Um, and of course, subject to US Patriots Act, OFAC, and other guidelines, uh, they are very, very bullish in this particular sector. Thanks, Ganesh. Another, uh, I mean, I'm clubbing a few questions here, and uh, that would be to you, Survey, that again touches upon some of the topics that you discussed. How does one deal with the difficulties in getting payment partners and social media partners or even celebrity endorsements? Uh, this is something that our audience have sought. Right. No, I think, Rishab, you're right. We've seen um, uh, gaming companies, at least initially, face some difficulty with regard to getting celebrity endorsements or uh, onboarding with uh, e-wallet companies and payment partners and and so on and so forth um look i think first and foremost like i mentioned there's a perception issue uh, and a social acceptance issue of uh, of gaming in india we need to demarcate that from gambling uh, very very clearly secondly uh, with social media in particular we've seen that a uh, uh, that an opinion or some sort of a a uh, certificate by by a practitioner given to the social media platform certifying that the game that is being offered is a game of skill and it does not amount to gambling has really helped and uh, maybe roland you can step in here but i do believe that aigf has also been playing an important role in helping uh, gaming companies uh, cross over the line on this one yes uh, surbi we we are doing uh... Uh, our best on behalf of our members uh, because uh, some of these uh, social media platforms don't have uh, uniform uh, laws uh, across board for let's say online poker as a segment or, or for, even for esports so one needs to make it a case by case uh, effort and uh, we okay. have been uh, we have been successful to a large extent on behalf of our members so yeah and the other points yeah. uh, We've already covered uh, earlier. Right. And, and Rishab, look, to sum this up, uh, this particular issue, I think these are teething issues. Uh, every new uh, sector, every new innovation or anything that is new, that is moving away from the normal brick and mortar sort of business always raises a few questions and eyebrows. And I do believe very strongly that these are very minor teething issues. A lot of it is already dealt with. We see a lot of uh, well well-known celebrities now associating themselves with the gaming companies so i think uh, very hopefully very soon this will be a thing of the past thank you Surbi. thank you roland and, and i agree with you Surbi, that social acceptance has to precede uh, regal, uh, legal and regulatory uh, blessings uh, you know that's very important for the industry uh, on the uh, there's one more question that we've received in interestingly on on what could one do if there are disruptive events in a company or in a business like uh, servers getting lost or uh, you know some some issues by the it uh, side so manindra i think you were discussing about uh, you know some of these issues uh, would you like to uh, share some thoughts on what should people do in, in these disruptive events yeah sure Isha. Uh, so i think there are two scenarios in which uh, this can actually happen and i mean this is something which is a live scenario in other sectors as well see if it is a routine failure or if it is something that has happened as a result of a flaw in the system 
you need to make sure that you are adequately protected in your terms and conditions and contracts uh, i mean because of covid 19 a lot of you would have heard of this term called force majeure but that is something wherein such disruptions can adequately be covered to ensure from a liability perspective however that said if this is because of an issue wherein certain people in control of your servers or your it personnel have are absconding or have, have moved out or have just left the job or something to that effect and you're not in control in that scenario it may be a little tricky because uh, like we spoke about earlier please take necessary steps try and have a dialogue with them get control and worst case scenario please do file uh, the necessary complaints and report it adequately to the authorities in our experience we have seen that a police complaint has gone a long way in settling a lot of issues i mean I can speak for one of the up and coming fantasy companies in Bombay who faced such a similar issue with a person who had the server and we could resolve it within 24 hours because an adequate complaint was filed, a statement was recorded, the person was called to the police station and it could be wrapped up. This one thing which we see very regularly that people somewhere are a little reluctant given that they're in a sector which can be misunderstood please please uh, overcome it i mean you're a legit company it's a legit practice online gaming is legit in india today so i don't think there should be any kind of reluctance when it needs to be taking affirmative action that that is what i feel should be done Risha. thank you manvendra and uh, and and thank you everyone actually this is uh, very helpful and before we end uh, to our audience, we would like to receive your feedback on this webinar. We will, uh, you know, we take all feedback that we receive very seriously and we'll keep your inputs in mind for similar exercises in the future. So, shortly we will put a poll on the screen. And this poll will be available to you for about 30 seconds. You can select an option by checking in your, on your screen. At the end of the webinar, we'll also there'll also be a short survey. We'll be really grateful if you can fill that in too. The poll is now closed, and thanks a lot for uh, for, for your feedback, guys. Uh, Ganesh would like to uh, say a short thank you note to everyone. Thank you, Risha. Uh, I must definitely tell you, uh, you've been a great moderator. Uh, Dolan, thank you very much again for uh, making time to uh, share, you know, come to this webinar and share your thoughts along with us. I thank my uh, fellow panelists. And of course, uh, uh, the IT support team, which has worked on, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the, to make this event a grand success. And uh, last but not the least, I would also sort of uh, like to place my thanks to my colleague Kevin Shah, who has worked with us in uh, in this particular webinar behind the scenes, and also to Sharanya, who is part of Roland's team uh, from AIGF, uh, who has definitely worked with us to make this webinar a grand success. And thank you everyone for being a wonderful audience. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Please do keep safe and hopefully this crisis that we are in currently will be behind us soon. And please keep playing, play responsibly.